This is episode 16 of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A.J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it, so take a minute to tell a friend. If you've done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. And I just want to point out here that this chapter was written back in 2014, well before a lot of the events that have taken place since then that actually parallel and bear out the suggestions or the theoretical ideas I had back when I wrote this, such as taking out transformers and power supplies and things like that. Thanks for listening. This podcast contains fleeting, explicit language. Chapter 35, The Grid, Winter, 2015 to 16. Quote, The Grid, a digital frontier. I tried to picture the cluster of information as they moved through the computer. What did they look like? Ships? Motorcycles? Were the circuits like freeways? I kept dreaming of a world I thought I'd never see. And then one day... End quote. Kevin Flynn, from Tron Legacy, 2010. Hey, Eva, did you see that article in Vice? Asked Eric as they jogged through Tower Grove Park. Eva was visiting to take a break from her busy fall out in Yellowstone. The one about how malware has been taking power plant computers hostage and holding them for ransom? Yeah, it grabbed my attention right away. How do we get in touch with people that can do that? I happen to know just the person. Note, Franceschi Bicherai, 2017. End of note. Lauren and Eric sat in a coffee shop in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It had been raining for days, and an endless stream of cars splashed by outside. Do you think she'll come? asked Eric. He had to repeat the question to get Lauren to look up from her book one second after. Note, Forstchen, 2009. End of note. You should read this as soon as I'm done with it. It describes the U.S. after EMPs knock out all electrical appliances in the grid. Life becomes rather Hobbesian. Nasty brutish in short? Uh Uh-huh. Still worth a read, though. You've heard of the Hobbesian trap, right? Asked Eric. He continued after Lauren shook her head. Remember the Simpsons episode with the monkey paw? Lisa wishes for world peace, all weapons are destroyed, and the aliens Kang and Kodos come to enslave the world because it was defenseless. Mo, the bartender, finds a board with a nail in it and uses this new weapon to free us from our oppressors. As they fly away, Kang, or Kodos, I, I don't remember, says something like, That board with the nail in it may have defeated us, but the humans won't stop there. They'll make bigger boards, with bigger nails, and soon they'll make a board with a nail so big it will destroy them all. Okay, so what's the trap? The ever-increasing efficiency of our weapons? No, it's the fear that makes us constantly attempt to one-up our enemies. If we knew the superpowers in the Cold War were not going to use their atomic weapons on one another, we could have saved billions or even trillions of dollars in defense spending. But because of the Hobbesian trap, we had to outdo the Soviets, who were trying to do the same to us. So what's the Hobbesian trap of today? Asked a voice from behind them. Eric and Lauren turned to see a middle-aged woman with short black hair parted to the left, wearing a dingy flannel over a dark t-shirt and black military cargo pants. Even in the cold, wet weather, she was wearing Teva sandals. Lizbeth! Eric jumped up and flung his arms around her. So good to see you, and to meet you, Lauren. You too, I've heard a lot about you. How's Hack? Has Dave mellowed at all? They all spent the next few minutes catching up on news about mutual friends. Thanks for meeting with me. I I didn't know if you would. Lisbeth looked around uncomfortably before responding. Yeah, uh, can we take a ride? I brought you a bike. Sorry, Lauren, I I didn't know you'd be here. I only have the one. It's okay, I want to finish this book anyway. And, Lisbeth said, turning to Eric, double sorry about the rain. No worries, said Eric. Let's go. As he stood up and looked towards the front door, Lisbeth caught his eye. No, she said, lowering her voice. Why don't you go towards the bathroom and out the back door? You'll find my truck locked up out there. The combo is 1933. Ride towards Mass Ave and I'll come find you. Eric exchanged a glance with Lauren before getting up and saying in a regular voice, I'll be right back. I've drunk too much tea. He walked to the back, past the bathroom, and out the door. Before long, he was pedaling down Massachusetts Avenue, and Lisbeth pulled up next to him, riding her recumbent. What's the deal? Was it the guy in the gray jacket? asked Eric, as droplets spattered against his rolled-up pant cuffs. Yeah, I see him around. Him and another guy. You don't mind riding while we talk? No, no. I I left my phone with Lauren. We should be fine. I know you're interesting, but why does the government think so, too? I hope I didn't trigger some surveillance by contacting you. I was about to apologize to you for the same thing. Were you being followed before you contacted me? I haven't been followed at all yet, actually. At least not overtly. You will be now, I'm sure. I guess I don't want to know what else you're up to. But I do want to know if you're still up to speed on our electrical grid network. Well, yeah, sure. 
I was surprised you mentioned it when you wanted to meet. Uh, you were never interested in it before. Well, it's been a while. Eric smiled as they pushed through a yellow light. I know I can trust you, so I don't need to beat around the bush. Did you hear about that thing at Yellowstone and with the mining execs last fall? Elizabeth whistled. No shit? Eric nodded. They rode in silence for a block. So I'm guessing you're looking for a systemic disruption. Why else would you come to me? Well, that all depends. On what? What you can confidently get done. Ah. Well, let's start at the beginning. How much do you know about our existing power grid? I know that it's aging. It's a pre-digital grid, which has been retrofitted to handle modern power loads. I know it's only a few grids that cover the whole country and that they've been subject to foreign hacking attempts. Note. See Koppel 2015 or Ream 2015 for more. End of note. And domestic ones, but that's not as publicized. Right, so that's an accurate, if superficial, description of the grid. It is an old system, and they did add in networking connectivity to help handle how power is generated today. Because of increased supply and demand, as well as diversified inputs like wind farms and home solar arrays, the grid must be more flexible and responsive than in the past. It uses networking to manage and balance the in and out flows of energy. If that balance is disrupted, the system can collapse. Is that where we come in? It can be, but we'd have to take out three or four networks simultaneously. The Western, Eastern, and Texas interconnections at a minimum, and the Quebec interconnection if we're being thorough. Uh, hey, veer right to stay on Mass Ave. She wiped raindrops off her glasses. Yeah, I remember, through the square. What's the most reliable way to get into one of these networks? Uh, sure, we'll loop around and head down to the river. Well, if you want to be sure of bringing it down, we'd have to build redundancy into the plan because that's what the grid has. We'd want the communications network to malfunction and overload the system at the same time we have some sort of structural failure. Structural failure? Yeah, like downing of long-distance high-voltage transmission lines. If the system was really ramped up and then we put a short in the system, the results could be pretty egregious. I think we've already developed a plan for that. Eric swerved around a pothole without skipping a beat. You'd be surprised how much information is available online. We've been able to find the dozen longest and highest voltage lines, as well as their exact locations, all listed on various websites. Have you been in touch with the Resistance Internationaliste? They've been working on this already in the Quebec New England transmission line. Note. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, 2004. La Montagne and Ling, 2015. End of note. The, oh, you mean the 2004 bombing? Yeah, and the Ukrainian nationalists more recently have seemed to have the right idea. Blow up the towers in remote, difficult-to-reach places. Out west, we'd have to take down the Pacific DC intertie, which runs along the whole coast. I'll put you in touch with one of the Resistance people. You'd like him. I think they'll be on board. Great, thanks. Uh, oh, okay, look for a lull in traffic and pull a Yui onto Brattle. Here, after that truck. They shot across two lanes in each direction and four crosswalks. Keep right on Brattle. Hey! called Eric as a college-aged woman stepped into the road, head down, and grossed in her smartphone. She looked up just in time to step back on the curb. Have a good one, called Eric over his shoulder. Elizabeth smiled at him. Some things never change, eh? Now, the other half of the equation is getting into the system, which is where you think I can come in. Eric nodded his head. Well, it has been a few years since I worked in the industry, but I think my code is still used across much of the network. Didn't you help design the control system? Yeah, the SCADA system that most of the networks use. Eric looked puzzled. SCADA? Supervisory Control and Data Analysis. And it wouldn't be difficult for me to get in. Even though those systems are supposed to be air-gapped from the internet, some companies cut corners, and I can get in from pretty much anywhere I have an internet connection. I think the best thing to do is to suppress the alarm system. That way, when the power lines go down, the system won't automatically shut down, and more systems will be fried by the short circuit. We could also have the system run hot. I mean, put everything at the top of its working capacity. That makes the catastrophic failure bigger. We can recreate the Aurora test, where some officials pretended to be hackers and cycled the circuit breakers on some major diesel generators, causing the engines to destroy themselves. It's called pinging. Note. Swearingen et al. 2013. End of note. L left at the fork, then right on Kennedy, she said as they came to a split in the road. Why do you think it'll be so easy to get in? <laughs> Aside from the fact that I designed the software, she smirked. The grid relies on hundreds of contractors to supply software and provide system input. Over 3,200 electric companies have access to some network. Private ownership means a hodgepodge of security, and the lack of regulation means poor coordination. It isn't hard to ferret out a weak link in the chain. Would you route your IP through Iran or somewhere? So far, the publicized attacks have come from there, and it might give you some cover. What about that program that bounces your traffic to a whole bunch of different proxies to disguise your trail? Oh, you mean Tor. 
The NSA is tracking anyone using Tor. Note. Rosenblatt, 2014. End of note. Or even anybody who is searching for information on Tor. It was developed by the U.S. government, after all, and it, it isn't just the Iranians. The Russians and Chinese are inside our networks, too. Door! Eric yelled as the driver's door on a parked car swung open and into the bike lane. The two were just able to swerve to avoid it. They exchanged smiles. When I lived in Mexico, my computer battery would die really quickly, and my friends complained that their appliances got fried because of brownouts. Could we do that on a large scale? Maybe. A series of brownouts could potentially damage appliances with electric motors, but the damage usually builds up over time, and we'd risk being found out. It's probably better to go for broke. What about taking out transformers? I've seen some groups targeting them. Note. Serrano and Helper, 2014. It isn't a bad idea on the small scale. Transformers are expensive, vital, and usually out in the open. Plus, we only have a limited backup supply, which means a coordinated effort could wreak havoc. If we could take down the network and knock out vital transmission lines, it wouldn't be necessary. Again, we wouldn't want them to add more infrastructure security if we started taking out the softer targets first. As they stopped at a red light, Lisbeth looked at Eric. My worry isn't our ability to knock out power to the country. The system is fragile. It'll actually be easy. My worry is, what happens next? It's one thing for New York to be without power for a weekend, but it's another if the entire country goes dark indefinitely. Some mucky mucks at FEMA were interviewed recently, and one said there was a 0% chance the system would go down. But if it did, we'd have to evacuate the major cities. The other said he was sure it was going to happen and that people should shelter in place. The idea of declaring martial law was even floated. Eric smiled back. I can't give you too many details because we have compartmentalized information, but this is more than just an attack on the electric grid. We're talking dismantling the industrial system. Part of the plan, though, is to prepare the public to overhaul their way of life. As the day comes closer, you'll see a national push for disaster preparedness. We're working behind the scenes in Washington. I can't go into any more details, but we've worked on a few high-level folks with sympathetic ears, and then some others who have been kind of duped into doing the right thing. Lisbeth rode for a few moments in silence. Okay, let's get on the bike path up there and head back along the Charles. They continued for a few minutes without talking. The rain was now a fine mist, covering their clothing in uniform dampness. Okay, she said. I'm in. End of chapter. Chapter 36. 3.1.1. Electricity. Electricity per se is not the problem. We are Luddites, but only in the true sense of that word. In the early 1800s, when a group of English weavers destroyed mechanized looms, they were not protesting the Industrial Revolution. They were protesting the changing relationship between society and technology. We are not against electricity. We are against the way in which our society has decided to use this tool. But let's start at the beginning. Most electricity is generated through the combustion of fossil fuels. By the United States Energy Information Administration, or the U.S. EIA's numbers, 39% of all of our energy goes to generate electricity, which is 42% from coal, 22% from natural gas, 22% from nuclear, 13% from renewables, and 1% from petroleum. Note, U.S. EIA 2015. End of note. Even Iceland, the world's leader in renewable energy, only generates 66% of its electricity from non-fossil fuel sources, and that is possible because it sits on a geothermal hotspot. This state of affairs is absurd when one considers that most of Earth's latitudes receive enough solar radiation to meet our current overconsumption of energy. Even Canada could power itself on the 5 to 11 kilowatt hours of sunlight that hits each square meter every day. If wind and biogas were added to solar, we would have a robust and sustainable energy system. The perceived need to generate this much energy leads to conflict and exploitation on the supply side. Our dependence on the Middle East for oil is the underlying concern of the U.S. government's desire for peace in the region, not quote-unquote freedom or democracy. The need for cheap coal has destroyed the health of miners for generations, not to mention how it ravaged the ecosystems unfortunate enough to find themselves on top of a coal bed. Our greed has enabled the desolation of northern Alberta, where tar sands are strip-mined from a pristine boreal forest, only possible because of the remoteness of the region and the complacency of the then-conservative government. Natural gas extraction through hydrological fracturing, so-called fracking, has caused earthquakes and methane leaks. The no-holds-barred approach to drilling in the U.S. and abroad has claimed countless lives and forever altered delicate biomes. And why? All because this type of energetic consumption is portrayed as inevitable and benign. Children who are taught that this is the only right way to live will grow up to be adults who never question this system of destruction. There is another way, but when we point this out, we are called eco-radicals, or even terrorists. We are not the ones destroying the world. We're the ones fighting to save what's left of it. 
Our appetite for electricity continues to grow, feeding the problems of production. In the U.S., we use at least three times more electricity today than we did half a century ago, and that's per person. Multiply that threefold increase by a 70% population increase, and we arrive at our current national consumption of more than 3.8 trillion kilowatt hours per year, or 32.5 kilowatt hours per person per day. This increase goes to increased heating and cooling, more appliances, and a profligate number of electronic devices, not to mention higher levels of consumption and production than ever before. Due to consumer demand for cheap energy, utilities have supplied our perceived need with the lowest cost alternatives, coal and natural gas. Instead of asking ourselves, should we use this much power, we're asking, how can we use more at ever lower prices? Unfortunately, our society only defines price by the cost of kilowatt hour, which has remained more or less constant since the 1970s when adjusted for inflation. This cost fails to take into account the deaths of miners, roughnecks, and soldiers. It ignores the tens of thousands of pollution-related asthma cases. It does not set aside enough to mitigate the inevitable accidents and spills. For every penny we save on our electric bills, we are paying dimes on externalized costs. End of chapter. Chapter 37. Terrorists Cripple Crimean Power Supply. Fall 2015. November 22, 2015. Kiev, Ukraine. Wired News Agency. Last night, two high-voltage power lines leading from Ukrainian power plants to Crimea were collapsed by bomb blasts. This follows on the heels of twin blasts damaging other towers two nights ago. No group has yet claimed responsibility for these attacks, but Ukrainian nationalist groups have been patrolling the area and are outspoken in their support of these actions. The patrols enforce a blockade of the Crimean Peninsula, which recently seceded from Ukraine to form its own Moscow-dependent republic. One nationalist said that they had stopped patrolling near the power corridor in order to give saboteurs the opportunity to attack the lines. The same patrol members are, however, blocking access of repair personnel to the transmission towers. As repairs are attempted, two million Crimeans must await energy from temporary generators and an eventual power bridge from the Russian mainland a construction project that can take until May of next year. Daily electrical demand in the peninsula is 1,200 megawatts, but the Crimeans are able to generate only six to 700 megawatts locally and must rely on long-distance transmission lines for the rest of their power. End of chapter. Chapter 38. Are you kidding me? Winter, 2015 to 16. Are you kidding me? Jair rolled back in his chair away from his computer. What? Eva looked over the top of her laptop. This is entrapment. What? The government is either stupid or clever. What already? I just googled security vulnerability pipelines, and one of the first pages is a TSA report on just that. Note, Transportation Security Administration, 2011. End of note. It lays out a how-to guide for crippling a pipeline. Plus, I found a few industry reports and academic articles on the same topic. Why would they publish this? Eva smiled at him. They wouldn't be so stupid with... Wait... Yep, now I tried the same search for highways and got a document from a group representing the various state departments of transportation. Jair, stop. Search for the Department of Homeland Security Critical Infrastructure and click through. Now click on the sector-specific plans. Oh my, yep. But this is a summary of each area where, yep, all we have to do, yep. Wait, there's another one from DHS. Note, Department of Homeland Security, 2004. End of note. Wow, it has a map of the pipeline infrastructure plus pictures of the various markers identifying their locations on the ground. Then it goes through different points on the pipeline. Pump stations, storage facilities, and, oh, here we go, block valve stations. It says these stations are, quote, enclosed in a security fence but are not manned and may be located in remote areas, end quote. And that it has a, quote, heavy-duty valve that is used to mechanically block flow through the pipeline during maintenance activities and emergencies, end quote. Why would they put this online? Eva watched Jair continue to read, his eyes occasionally bulging. There's a whole section here on the greatest vulnerabilities and consequences. It says the greatest vulnerabilities are the pumping stations, which take up a half a year to repair, and shutting down a crude line could starve refineries and cause even national disruptions. Oh, and here's a two-for-one. Pipeline crossings near bridges are hard to repair, so a bridge collapse could halt not only the pipeline, but also barge and other associated transport. But wouldn't that cause an oil spill? Not if the emergency valves on either side of the river, which are required, were shut first. Oh, and then there's the digital side of things. Do we have someone who can get into the control system? Maybe. Tell me what you need and I'll see what I can do. Oh, right. Compartmentalization. Well, 
I have to read this a little more thoroughly, but it looks like I need help with the SCADA system and some small explosive charges. If I can get those, I can work up a plan to cripple the pipeline system without major spills. Eva smiled back at him. Jire laughed. They even say in here the system is vulnerable because this report is a public one. End of chapter. End of episode 16 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com. <laughs>